I'm going to talk about themes today. You may be thinking, well, what that's, what's that got to do with themes? Um, sometimes dealing with themes can actually seem a little bit like uh, mixing up cards and not knowing what the hell's going on, because uh, they can be a little bit confusing. So, yeah, that's a really tenuous link. Um, but you can call me Mr. Tenuous, and we'll, we'll leave it at that. Um, so, with that aside, let's go on with this. Um, I'm not going to go into all of this. The only thing I will point out is my Twitter handle, which is Mark I. Allison. If you follow me on Twitter, uh, and you can follow me now if you want, I will be live tweeting during the talk, so I'll be posting links to documentation and, and relevant stuff as we go. So why are themes important? I've just I'm just going to tweak my slide size slightly because I think these are going to render really horribly. So just bear with me for one second because I'm already aware of a little problem, but we can quickly resolve it. Uh, let's just go down a tad. Let's try that. So hopefully this will be better. Um, so they allow styles to be consistently applied throughout the, our app. Now I'm going to try and move around a little bit so that if I'm blocking the slides, if I move, you might be able to see them a little bit. Um, can't do much for the lectern here because it's sort of immovable and it's sort of blocking one side of the screen. Uh, I've, I've become to uh, call it Hannibal lectern as we've been going on. Um, so they allow us to apply consistent styles throughout our app if we use it correctly, which is a really useful thing to be able to do. They can facilitate, facilitate that's a bit easy for me to say this time on a Friday afternoon. They can facilitate design language changes. Um, so designers like to uh, change the, how apps look and feel, quite often based on user feedback, quite often just because they like changing things. Um, and if we get this right through our theming, we can actually apply those design language changes quite easily. They can make white labeling easy because white labeling is where you maybe have to produce a single app that serves multiple clients. Each client has their own branding, their own color scheme. If you leverage themes correctly, you can apply these brands uh, on different uh, build flavors quite easily with no, very little or no code changes just by applying uh, custom themes for each client. And this is the probably the big one, everyone. The sort of common uh, rumor is that there's going to be a system-wide dark theme coming in Android Q, and so everyone's going to be wanting to have a dark mode to sort of fit in with the system. And Themes facilitate all of that as well. So this is why I sort of decided to do this talk at this time because I think a lot of people are going to want to uh, do themes that aren't doing them. Um, and I've worked on a number of projects that I've joined and really don't see themes being used that effectively. Uh, and this is by experienced developers. This isn't by uh, uh, newbies or anything like that. It's because themes are a bit hard. So why are they hard? Let, let's sort of consider some of the aspects of themes. Everything is built around styles. What's a theme? What's a style? Well, you define this thing called a style. And then you have a thing called a theme. You can also have a text appearance. Then that's also a style. You then have theme overlays. Now, what's that and how does it relate to a theme? And it's still defined as a style. And then you have these things within themes called theme attributes. And it all gets a little bit confusing. Um, so we're going to try and, we're just going to go back to basics a little bit and try and explain what all these various things are and how they work together and what their specific use cases are. 
And hopefully, you'll get a, a reasonable picture so that if you know a bit, you might think, oh, I know this. But when you add all the separate bits together, you'll see quite how powerful this framework is. And this isn't something that there's a mini SDK for. It's been there since API 1. The basic framework hasn't changed an awful lot since then. There have been changes because certain view types have had additional attributes that you need to uh, manage differently at different API levels. But the actual framework itself uh, is pretty stable. You've had new uh, theming components come in, like material, um, that kind of stuff. But again, the actual core framework really hasn't changed an awful lot. So at the core is this thing called a style. So let's firstly think, what is a style? It's a collection of key value pairs. That's it. Um, the key represents a view attribute. So where you have a layout, you have a number of attributes on each view in the layout. And the name of those attributes is the key in your style. The value is what you want to apply that style. So if we look at a layout here, this is typically the kind of things that the pointer's not really working. So um, in the layout, I'll move over this way so that you can see it. This is a, a fairly standard text view. We've got a number of attributes there. And let's look at one, say the background. So this is the background color of the text view. The name of this is Android colon background and the value is just a hex value. We can easily convert this to a style. By moving it over, into a style and then applying style to the widget. So functionally this is identical. All we've done is moved that attribute into the style and applied it by applying the style. That's all styles are. They are just ways of moving the things that affect the visual appearance out of our layout. The layout is about how things are positioned and sized relative to each other and the style is how they appear. And so by separating the two, it means you can reuse styles across the entire app without having lots of, uh, if you have a, a small tweak that the designer makes that he wants applying to all text views, if you've got everything defined in your layouts, you've got quite a big job to go through every single one and find every single instance. Whereas if you've got that moved into a style, you change the style, it fits exactly that. So, which of these other uh, attributes could we actually uh, move into the style? So let's start at the top. So we've got the ID. Absolutely not. This is definitely not part of the style. This is the identity of this widget within the layout. If you have multiple widgets within the same layout with the same ID, you're going to have problems. You're going to enter a world of pain. If you're using constraint layout, you will actually get errors because it just cannot handle multiple views with the same ID in the same view hierarchy. So if you move this into the style, every widget that you apply that style to will get the same ID, which is a really bad thing. It's the identity of this individual text view and shouldn't be applied to all of them. So this is definitely part of the layout. The layout width and height, once again, these are absolutely part of the layout. There's kind of a clue in the name. Anything with the layout prefix really deserves to live within the layout. And the reason for this is the layout prefix represents the layout params that are inherited from the parent. So if you've got a parent view group, the child, as it's inflated, gets the layout params from the parent. And these vary depending on what type the parent is. So a constraint layout has its own layout params. A linear layout has its own layout params. And they get passed to the child. If you move those into the style, the style has absolutely zero visibility of what parent any given widget is going to have. 
and you're breaking the contract between the text view and its parent if you move them away. And if you actually think you were code reviewing a layout that had a constraint layout parent, all the constraints have the layout prefix. So if they moved into the style, trying to code review and understand that XML file, when the constraints weren't there, you had to look in the style for them, is going to be a nightmare. And if your code review, uh, code review passes, then uh, yeah, you really uh, should worry about who's reviewing your code. So we'll skip the text color for a second. The text, you could argue that sort of is a bit about how it appears, but really it's not. If you imagine you've got five text views on the same page, if you apply the same style to them and the text is in the style, they're all going to have the same name, uh, the same text, which is going to be a pretty boring layout. So the text is really part of this individual text view. You have two text views next to each other. It's unlikely you want the same text, so it's part of this. For the final one is the text color. Now this is certainly apparent, except we can move it out and we'll create a new style and we'll reference this with text appearance. So we've got now both a style and a text appearance applied to this text view. We'll, we'll go into the details of what the specifics are about text appearance in a second. But this text appearance in the layout is now still controlling what the text looks like. So we could actually move that into the style. And so we get the widget style uses a specific text appearance. Uh, and we've simplified our layout. The layout is now containing just those uh, attributes that control its relationship with its siblings, how it appears within uh, the parent and the text and things like that. And its visuals are all controlled from the style. So what's the difference between a style and a text appearance? If you look at the Java doc for, or the official documentation for text view, it subclasses view. A style gets applied to any view. And if you actually look at the, 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 the docs for view, pretty much any of the attributes for view, you could use it in a style and it will apply to any widget. The key thing here is look at how many subclasses of text view there are. There's six direct subclasses and 14 indirect subclasses. So there's an awful lot of classes that depend on text view. And text appearance is a way of applying styles to a text view or anything that subclasses text view. So whereas a style is for all widgets, a text appearance is really things like text color and text size and the font, which aren't relevant to all widgets, but they are relevant to uh, text view. And so if you write a custom control that subclasses text view, you can apply a text appearance to it and it will just get all those same benefits. The other way you can use text view is with spans. If you create a text appearance span, you can give it the ID of the style that we just created, which is our text appearance, and you can apply that just to a block of a, a char sequence or a spanable. So it's not just working at view level, but it's just controlling how uh, text is rendered within the text view. So we know what a style is, we know what a uh, text appearance is, what about a theme? So a theme is defined in exactly the same way as a style and uses uh, the style element. But the difference between a style and a theme is a style affects the widget you apply the style to, whereas a theme affects all widgets within a given hierarchy. So we'll see how we can apply it in a minute. Um, but you can also apply styles to specific widget types. So you can apply a style that will affect all text views that appear within the view hierarchy to which the theme is uh, applied. 
And it can also affect the window appearance. The window appearance actually includes things that are outside the, the bounds of our app. So things like the system chrome and the color of the navigation bar and if we're in immersive mode, that sort of stuff, that's all part of the system. But we can affect that from within a theme. And we can define theme colors, which are really useful things, and we'll look at those in a moment. So here we have a simple thing. It starts exactly the same way as we started with the style. Here we apply Android text view style and give it a style value. And this will affect every single text view that gets inflated within this thing. So they will pick up this style from the thing as they're inflated. We'll see the mechanism for how they actually do that in a second, and it's really simple. But this is a really powerful thing, and it, this isn't limited to text view. This is limited to pretty much all of the system uh, widgets that we have. You can apply a default thing. And so we can control how all of the, the progress bars and the whole of the app look, or within a given activity, depending on where the thing gets applied. So here's how we could change the color of the, the navigation bar. So if we want the, the nav bar at the bottom, the system nav bar, to fit in with the color scheme of our app, we can do so here. So we can control things outside of the app, outside of the view hierarchy that this is actually going to get applied to. And then we have, I'm sure most of you are familiar with color primary, which these started appearing in Lollipop when we got material design. And this is a color value that gets applied to the theme. And individual uh, widgets and styles can reference this and just pick up a color value from the theme. So what is this color primary? It's actually designed, uh, defined in the framework? Uh, in, in the framework code as an attribute. If anyone here has ever written a custom view, you know you can create custom view attributes. And this is just an attribute that becomes part of the theme. And so, um, what we get, we can actually look up this attribute by using this ATRA notation, and we just look up this attribute, and it's going to resolve here. Um, this is actually referencing this attribute that's defined in the framework, and here is where the value of that gets declared. And we can use that in our styles as well. So here we have the two styles that we created earlier. And rather than using fixed color values for here, we can actually look up these attribute values from the, the theme. And if these styles get uh, applied within different themes, we'll get different values for these colors. So just by making tweaks to the theme, we can control how all these styles will get rendered. And uh, this is pretty powerful stuff. The next thing we have is theme inheritance. So here we have a pretty standard theme which uh, just declares a couple of uh, color attributes. If we add a second theme, these two, two themes are completely independent of each other. But if we give theme two a parent of theme one, we get something quite interesting. The theme two inherits the attributes that we defined in theme one. But anything that we declare locally, in this case color accent, will get overridden. So we'll inherit color primary from theme one, and we'll use a custom value of color accent if we then apply this theme two to something. So we're kind of overlaying what's there. The other notation we can use is this dot notation. So rather than declaring the parent, we can just do theme one dot theme two. And theme two will inherit from theme one, and functionally these are identical, but it's just a shorthand. There's one word of warning here that if theme one, if we deleted, oh, sorry, uh, I scooched forward too quickly, I'm afraid. Uh, if we were to delete theme one, 
we would now get an error on theme two because uh, at build time it will detect that theme one doesn't exist uh, with this dot notation. Uh, you can get around this if we were to say rename this to theme three, which doesn't exist, and then explicitly add a parent, it would allow us to use that name theme three, but then still apply the parent from whatever we explicitly declared. So to apply these, uh, it's pretty easy. Uh, at application level, in our manifest, we can apply a thing. This thing will then get applied to everything. Anytime we inflate a view within an activity or manually or whatever, everything will uh, extend from our application context. And if we don't declare anything else, this thing will just get used everywhere. And that is pretty powerful stuff when we've seen how a theme can control how every single text layout looks. By doing this, we get some really across-the-board behaviors. But we can also override at an activity level by defining a theme at the activity. This will then just get applied when that activity is inflated. And we can get slightly different look and feels on certain activities. But we will still inherit from theme two and then we will just override what is defined in theme one on top of that. So we get this kind of overlay behavior as we're going on. Within our layouts, we can apply a theme to any view group, and that will affect the look of that particular view group and all of its children. I'm sure many of you have used the, the light themes with dark action bar. And these are using these kinds of techniques to apply a different thing at a certain level of the view hierarchy. Uh, in that case, we're on the toolbar. And so you can get these two very different themes being applied. And so theme two will now be applied to this text view. If we inflate, as this is inflated, the text view will get whatever style we declared in theme two. Unless we over, uh, override it here. If we specify an explicit style, this will override the default. So we can tweak behavior on certain themes if we don't want the system-wide one. So we may have a case where we have two buttons, one of which needs to be a yes button, one a no, and we want different colors. So then we can just apply a different thing, a different style to the specific button that differs from the system norm. The other way we can do this programmatically is in an activity or fragment, we can call set thing before we perform our, our inflation. In this case, the inflation is called in set content view, and as long as we call set thing before we inflate, then we're good. If we call it afterwards, it will have no effect, we'll get the, whatever is the default thing. A really powerful, powerful thing is this thing called context theme wrap. What this does is it takes a context. Every context has a theme. Uh, if you're getting a, a, a context that is created from the application context, you will get the theme that you define in your manifest as the default app theme. But if you use context theme wrapper, it will create a wrapper around that theme and apply uh, around that context and overlay it with whatever theme you specify. And so then you can just get a layout inflator from that theme context, and that theme will be applied when you inflate anything using that layout inflator. And if you already have an instance of layout inflator, you can call clone in context with that theme context to get exactly the same effect. And so I've used this word overlay a few times, but this is just the, the concept that as you apply a theme on top of the other, it will replace any duplicate attributes in there, but it will inherit anything that isn't duplicated in the overlay theme. And again, this is how uh, toolbar works in the, the uh, light theme with a the dark toolbar. So it can be applied using context theme wrapper. It can also be applied in a layout file by using the Android theme attribute. So it inherits from the current theme, 
overrides defined items and provides this localized overlay which will affect anything that's uh, below this in the view hierarchy. So if we have a custom view, how do we leverage all this and get the benefit of, uh, like we covered earlier, text view can actually look up how all text views should look from the theme. How do we get that in our custom widgets? We can define our own attributes. So this is, we define these in exactly the same way as we can define a custom view attribute. And then all we do, sorry if this is a bit low, but this def style attribute, variable, we can just give it this default style. And so if this isn't specified when our custom view is inflated, it will inherit this attribute. So it will look this up from the theme to obtain the style for this as it's inflated. So it's a tiny little change. But we can now do stuff like that in our theme. We just define the value of custom style, uh, custom view style, and give it an actual style, and it will resolve from that uh, attribute name to the style we define when this gets inflated. And this is exactly what TextView and all the other widgets are doing. They all have their own attribute names, and that's how we apply these across the board styles to every widget of a specific type. So a quick case study. Um, here's a real world example. This was a problem I had to solve quite recently. Um, we had a back end uh, which was supplying us with a, a form of rich text, a really simple text marker. Um, this was coming down as a JSON file um, and it was a, a <laughs> essentially a hierarchy of different nodes. So I, first thing I did was use uh, JSON to inflate this into a DOM, effectively, which is just a tree of fairly simple node objects. So a, a nested uh, tree of objects. Um, so some of these nodes represented a named style. So we had these styles, which I'll just refer to as style one, style two, for the sake of this. Um, and these were containers where you could have other nodes which contained text. And so the intention was where text appeared within one of these named styles, it needed a particular text appearance of applying to it. So I achieved this by creating this mapper. And what this did was this took this DOM and it flattened it into a char sequence. But the char sequence was actually a spannable and within that spanable, I embedded a load of uh, spans which represented these styles. So by using spans, we could apply these to the blocks of text which appeared in those in the DOM, but were just affecting a subsection of the text. And this was all working quite smoothly, and we got it working nicely. It was only about uh, 150 lines of code in the, this uh, mapper. And then we got a requirement change. Uh, very late on after it was all working. But these no, name styles, the mappings could change. Well, this was a problem. Um, what this meant was we had these styles called style one, style two, style three, etc. If we use this in one activity, style one would map to one text appearance. But if we used it in a different activity, that text appearance needed to be something different. Um, and these were all actually the material uh, styles from the material type scale. So style one in one activity had to uh, map to heading four, and in another it had to map to subtitle one. So that suddenly threw a bit of a spanner in the works and this stopped uh, being fit for purpose. Um, I did manage to eventually talk them out of this. Um, because uh, it was going to cause huge confusion to the content creators who would have to do this context switch 
knowing where this was going to be used, and that style one would represent one thing here and another thing there. And the students agreed that they would just have this fixed set so that style one always means the same thing, and it would then be down to the content owners to know that they had to use style four to get this smaller stuff. But, but that was only after I got this actually fixed. Um, and how did I go about doing this? So the first thing I did was created some theme attributes for these named styles. So we've got the, the attribute name is style one, style two. So these represent the styles from the DOM. We then create a theme which defines values for these styles. So style one maps to material headline four, style two maps to material components body one, we can then create a separate thing called theme two, which inherits from theme one, but then overrides the value of style one and applies subtitle one instead. So if we use theme one when we were applying uh, this mapper, we would get one lot of mappings, and if we applied theme two, we'd get another lot of mappings. And so problem solved. So to use this, we were using, I'm trying to work out what's best to stand here. Uh, because we were using Dagger 2, we were injecting these instances of the mapper. This takes a single argument, which is a context. So we use a different context theme wrapper. Uh, this is slightly overrun because uh, uh, that's why I have to adjust the screen earlier. Um, so it's slightly too big, but that should actually be theme one. And for activity two, we do exactly the same thing, but we just apply a different theme through the context theme wrapper. So we're using Dagger to, for different contexts, we can actually apply these different uh, mappings to the mapper that then gets injected. So then in the code itself, uh, there's this, which looks a little scary to start with, but this is the bit that's doing all the hard work. So the first thing we do is we obtain the attribute ID. So the function takes a name, and this name will be the name of this style node. So it'll be style one, style two, etc. So it looks this up, which it's going to get from the thing that's been applied, because this is looking it up from the context and remember that Dagger put a context theme wrapper around it. The next thing we do is create a type value, which is the, what we're going to get a return value in. We then call a resolve attribute on the thing. So this is going to look up this attribute from the thing. The first argument is the attribute ID that we just obtained. The second argument is the type value, which is going to get the, the return value. And the third argument is a boolean. Um, and this is a powerful little boolean that this is whether it's going to recurse. So if this tries to resolve this particular attribute and the attribute resolves to another attribute, it will go again. And it will keep going until it ha hits a concrete resource ID, such as a style. But if it hits another attribute, it will just keep uh, going. If we turn that to false, it will just return whatever that resolves to. So if it resolves to another attribute, it will return us an attribute ID rather than a resource ID, um, which is a resource ID, but uh, it's a specific type of resource ID. Um, but by using true there, we get this recursive behavior. And so then, we just return the resource ID, which we can then to look, use to look up a text appearance, which then gets applied to a text appearance span. And we saw how, how to do that earlier. So with very little actual code here, this is the only real code I had to add to this, other than a call to this to actually just resolve the star name to a star. Uh, and that was it. And it fixed the problem uh, with very little code, uh, no conditional logic. That was all handled by Dagger by injecting what we needed in the right place. And 
not really very much at all uh, of much complexity, but we made full use of the theming library, and that's now available to other teams within the, the company who get this all for free wherever they consume this same rich text contents from, from the back end. So a little bit of code, and it's got some huge potential, and it's been uh, talked about being used quite widely throughout the app now. So I just want to finish with talking a little bit about naming. Um, because I'm sure most of us know that naming is hard. Oh, no, did I leave that in? Um, I think naming is what separates good developers from great developers. Um, if you're good at getting names for your classes and your variables, your code is so much easier to understand. But it's not easy. Um, uh, it's particularly true of API design as well. If you have a, a, a well-named API, it makes the, it almost self-documenting. But it, it's a skill. It's not e easy to, to do. And it applies equally when we come to naming in themes. So let me digress a little bit. Um, but <clears throat> years ago, um, Pat and Richard gave birth to this lovely baby boy. And they decided to call him Mark. And you may think that's a good name. It's a bad name. You might have thought, well, I don't know. Uh, Mr. Tenuous was a better name, for example. Um, but it doesn't actually describe anything about me. You wouldn't know what my character was, or what, even what I look like, or anything about me, just from my name. Other than maybe, you could maybe infer that I was a boy rather than a girl. But not much more than that. And that kind of naming doesn't really work for code, because it helps if the name gives some uh, insight into what this thing represents. More so when we come to think about uh, styles and themes which represent visual uh, appearances. And we're kind of wired so that if we're thinking of a visual system, we think of the names in a visual manner. So if we were to apply that to me, I'll let you into a little secret. When I was first born, I didn't have much hair. Um, so, it might be a reasonable assumption that if my parents had decided to call me Baldy Slaphead, um, then that might actually be a name. And if you look at me these days, you might think, they got that right. They showed great insight with that naming. But then at some point this happened. Um, uh, I, I won't say how old I was there, but at that age, if my parents had decided to call me Baldy Slaphead, I think you would have said, that's probably not the best of names. And our themes are kind of, uh, our styles are kind of like the same thing. That if you have a particular color value, and the design has it as red, the temptation is, in your color style, you call it red or use the word red in the name. And if at some point the design changes and the color value color changes to blue, you can't just change the, the hex code and then leave the name intact. So you've got extra work to do to start renaming stuff. So this is why you really want to avoid naming stuff in your styles, themes, colors, all of this stuff about what they look like. You try and need to think what they represent within the system, which is a bit harder. But if you can do that, it will make things much easier to maintain. But we can take some hints from material design, because those people who worked on that have thought long and hard about it. Color primary. That can be anything it wants. That can be any color we define. And the name described, this is a primary color, this is a hero color that's going to be used uh, widely throughout the app. 
so we can get a, 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 a feel for how this is going to be used from the name. And it doesn't matter if the actual color value changes, the meaning of the name remains constant. So we can happily change the value that this maps to without any problems whatsoever. And in the, uh, more recently, they've started adding things like on-color primary. And this is a, a, a nice addition because this is clearly making an association between two different colors. So you have color value and you have on color, uh, sorry, color primary and on color primary. And what this does for us is if we have a background that is color primary and we put some text on it, if we use the background as color primary and the text color on color primary, this actually is pretty easy to understand. It doesn't matter what those values map to, but this is text of one color on a background, and having the on gives us the context of where this particular color is intended to be used. And the reason this can be important is particularly if we're having different things uh, in our app for either dark mode or light mode, or because we have white labeling, you need to make sure that you have sufficient contrast between the background and foreground colors, A, because you just can't read the text if, uh, if there's not, but also for accessibility reasons. For visually impaired users, you need to have a certain level of, uh, of contrast there, otherwise they're gonna really struggle. So this is easy to understand in our styles. And when we actually look at our color resources, this is a little difficult to see, but you can see the color swatches that we get in Android Studio. You just get a, 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 at least a, a clue that there's sufficient contrast there. So you might be able to point out to the uh, designer if you're entering those, I'm not sure these are gonna work, but if he doesn't believe you, you just run it up and show him and get a screenshot and show him or her. And, uh, you know that uh, you, you'll get early clues, but just by using uh, naming in sensible ways and try and uh, name things about what they represent, or uh, you know, like warning rather than red. Warnings are quite often reds and yellows and, uh, and those kinds of colors, but if you were to call it warning or error, it represents a particular state rather than the color itself, and it doesn't matter if the color value has to change, your naming doesn't cause you a problem, so your code becomes, or your styles and themes become much easier to maintain. So that's it, I'm running late as I often do tend to waffle on a bit. Um, so I hope you've uh, enjoyed Chicago Roboto, it's been another great one. Uh, I would hang around at the end, but I have to rush to the airport pretty much straight after I finish talking, so. Uh, uh, but just before I finish, uh, I'll preemptively answer one quick question that often comes up. And the answer is no, I'm not going to share my slides. Uh, if those that haven't seen me before, there aren't any slides. Um, I'm actually running an Android app on my trusty Pixel Slate. And uh, it's uh, basically all of the slides are using Android layouts, animations, vector drawables, all that kind of stuff. Um, there's a blog series that if those of, that are following on Twitter, uh, can anyone confirm, did the tweets go out? Yeah. Great stuff, thank you. Uh, it's always a bit hairy if the Wi-Fi plays up, if I, I've disconnected from the Wi-Fi and then they don't go. Um, and so that's kind of how I'm able to, to live tweet because the app's doing all that kind of stuff for me. Uh, and it's open source, and so there should be a link on Twitter that you can go to the code, you can view the slides, which are just layouts, and you can, you know, just have a play with it. Um, it's probably more for some of my previous talks where there's animations and stuff, you can get into those and dissect them and stuff. So these are more sort of quite dry slides, but, you know, go and have a look. And see if you can. So, uh, and... That's about it. So thank you very much, and I hope you've enjoyed it.